All right, thanks everyone. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Jonathan Reese. I teach at CSU Pueblo, a couple hours south of here. And I'm also co-president of the Colorado AAUP. I was just bragging in the car over here that I will manage to get through the entire day without having to say anything. Um, but it turns out that I got here before a close personal friend of mine was speaking. So I wanted to just take the opportunity to introduce you to him. This is Jonathan Poritz. He teaches math at CSU Pueblo. Um, but he is also, besides being an accomplished mathematician uh, and accomplished computer scientist, uh, he wrote a book uh, which is available over there. It's called um, Education is Not an App. Uh, he wrote it with me. And I can say that the best testament that I have to what a great guy he is that we managed to write a book together and he only tried to kill me twice. <laughs> <laughs> that you know of. That I know of, that's true. <laughs> it might have been a few unsuccessful attempts, uh, but he is uh, truly a man of letters in the broadest sense of the word, and what he's going to be talking about is sort of the theme of our book, which is the influence of technology on higher education, particularly the labor and uh, academic freedom implications. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Porch. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to try to use this because um, I usually project well, but I'll also I want to cover everyone. So I'm going to try to keep this a little short. I know we're a little um, we're running behind schedule all morning, so and I, I feel it's unfair that I'm the only one up here now. So I'm going to do just a kind of abbreviated thing. I've, I've been trying to edit my plans for what I would say today. We're also listening to the great things we've heard so far this morning, and I'll, I'll just want to kick to some, stick to some um, really key points. Um, I think that uh, what I have to say is also a little bit, it's going to seem a little bit of a different flavor from things we've heard so far, and I think that we're looking forward to for this afternoon, um, because um, there's, this seems to be that people's lives are really at stake. You know, adjuncts who had been dismissed, people who really fought academic freedom battle, battles very personally. I guess I want to talk about um, you know, the future, uh, as the title of somewhere appeared, um, and certainly in our book, is, is about the future of impacts of technology on higher education, and so it's kind of... I want us to play the long game now and um, plan ahead. And it's a little bit hard for us. Um, I, like many people in this room, have a lot of gray hair, and it's hard to keep up with the current technology. And I want us to think about this and do something which is, you know, as you know, the, the, the last panel was just talking about, it's hard to do, get organized and, and um, plan ahead. It's hard uh, and it's sort of challenging for us, but we should try to do those things anyway. I think it's challenging for us also to face these looming issues with technology, but I think it's, it's worth um, getting out of your comfort zone here. And I suppose it's easier for me to say that maybe than for many people in this room, because I'm a computer geek also, from, so I was a math, I've tr formally trained in mathematics, but I've been programming since I was in middle school, and so it's e a little bit easier for me. So I may say, you know, come on, go out there and you know, make your own website, and that may sound a little cheap for me to say it because it's, it's more um, in my daily week, but I really, daily week, but I, I hope that people will try to do some of these things. So I wanted to say, I think I have two kind of things that we need to be aware of, two sort of bits of, of scary news or bad news and one piece of very good news. And hopefully, um, you know, I, I, they're all sort of, um, uh, the last one is more maybe things that people are not, are not widely aware of. The first two bits of kind of um, difficult news to hear are things that we're all aware of, but I think that uh, we should be aware, that we should pay attention to them, and maybe I can help, help think about them in a different perspective. So. I want to talk about technology in higher ed, and I think there are lots and lots of things we hear. Um, you know, Silicon Valley rules the kind of cultural landscape. There's a disruptive change, technology is changing so fast. I was just having a conversation with someone about Moore's Law during one of the previous breaks. And Moore's Law, if people have not heard of it, Moore's Law is a, it was um, proposed by Gordon Moore, who's the president of Intel Corporation, um, I don't know, 20 years ago now, and it was about a prediction he had noticed that the power you can get of a computer, computational power, was doubling for constant amount of money that you spent on it about every two years. So that's doubling time, so that's exponential growth. Exponential growth is really amazing, and I think um, a lot of the things that technology is hitting education is because Moore's Law is in the background, and computer scientists are, you know, have a lot of hard problems that we haven't solved, but if the machine, you just wait along, wait long enough, the computers are so damn fast, even your lousy solution to this problem will work in the real world. So a lot of the, you know, AI is going to change the whole employment and, and landscape. And um, a lot of the scare stories you hear today 
um, about on high tech changing the world we live in, it's just because we've, you know, enough time has gone by and that exponential curve has brought the power of these devices up to an amazing level. I, I suspect that everyone in this room has in their pocket more computational power than the entire human race had at the time we put humans on the moon, right? Um, so anyway, so uh, technology is, so we, we hear a lot of discussion about technology being very disruptive in many different fields. Um, AI is going to disrupt the employment market. Place and you know, no lawyers because briefs will be written by AI, etc. Um, and we hear a lot about this also in um, education. And so I just wanted to point out that these things are around, around in the environment. And um, you know, so just name a few of the things that we have to hear all the time. Um, so everything going online, online education. People, I've heard conversations about you know, oh, my institution is starting an online program and degree programs, and can we be sure that they still have quality in them? Standing up for the quality, as we heard. Um, Nate talk about and you know the, these so these are things we have to be aware of. There's also um, MOOCs, so MOOC of course massive open online course. My co-author John Larice was kind of the MOOC guy for a long time. He had a, he has a wonderful blog, um, more or less bunk. Look for it on the net. I mean, you're not writing to it all not, right on it all that much these days. But anyway, he, he was the kind of he had the most carefully thought through cogent discussions about when MOOCs were a terrible idea for a long time, and so he was sort of. Um, the anti-MOOC guy. In fact, we sort of started, got started on this book partly because I once I said to him, hey, you should write, a, you should take those things and make a book out of them. And then we, so we said, well, no, no. So we had discussions starting in some, hope, I was hoping to put my star to his, his uh, MOOC fame. Um, anyway, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing that people hear, so MOOCs are these uh, massive open online courses. There are tens of thousands of people who sign up for some of these courses with the supposedly superstar professors from the R1s who produce CAN materials, and there are a lot of automated support for these pro courses. I've taken three or four MOOCs. I don't know if any of you have taken MOOCs. They're, they can be kind of fun edutain edutainment. Um, and the thought was they would be transforming education. We no longer have to teach general education courses because you could take a whole battery of MOOCs to get your either gener general education requirements out of the way. So that's something that would obviously change the dynamic. And if, I'm not an R1 institution, maybe my, I will no longer be allowed to teach introduction to statistics because there'll be some very fancy statistician at Stanford who will can a good description of statistics and no one will ever need to teach it again. So that clearly has some scary implications for the labor market for academia. Um, MOOCs have kind of, so the New York Times made 2012 was the year of the MOOC and it's somewhat died since then. The founder of one of the MOOC providers called Udacity there's Sebastian Thrun is his name. He's one of these um, people with a Bond villain type name. Um, and he, he was famously said a few years after, after Udacity, you know, he has this company, Udacity, um, and he famously said, well, we're just actually not doing a very good job. So he's kind of reoriented his MOOC providing service to um, corporate clients and doing corporate uh, training with them in MOOCs. But, so this is the thing that's in, in the environment we have to be aware of. I just for our day-to-day -day life in, in ca on campuses, um, other things that I think you, you know technology influences. So many of us are, are at an institution that uses an LMS. That's the acronym for Learning Management System. You know, Blackboard, Canvas, Desire to Learn, um, and so the LMS is this whole environment that wraps around everything you do. All your communications with your students are through the LMS. You have. They can look at their grades. Um, their all testing is done through LMSs. A lot of the, uh, the contingent faculty don't have any choice. They're told you will run an LMS. The, the, the structure of your, um, inter you know, your class is maybe given to you, and you have absolutely no choice because of the lack of effective academic freedom for contingent faculty. So those are other influences. Um, other things that, you know, the ways that um, I think that high tech technology is changing um, what we do. Um, so there's some things that relate quite similarly to what you see, um, all the discussions in the newspaper about the network um, in, in, um, in society in general, I think we were, it's reflected also on campuses. So for example, the whole net neutrality issue, so net neutrality was the, the idea that data moving through the network should be not discriminated upon by the people who are moving the data around. So the internet service providers should treat all data the same. And of course, if, if then some internet service provider has been acquired by a company that also, you know, pr produces uh, movies, then they may w and distributes them from, you know, Netflix or something. If somebody buys, a, uh, they're in a deal with uh, internet service providers. They may want to make this streaming of their videos happen faster than the streaming of some competitors' videos. 
Um, so this sounds a lot like you know, freedom of access to information. And the same thing can happen on a campus. So um, where on your campus the high-speed networks are put, and um, on the whole, the client is the, always, is always, the consumer is always right. So on my campus, an enormous amount of money has been sent in the last few years upgrading the, the Wi-Fi hotspots in places that a lot of students hang out because they want to be able to sit in the library lobby and do their work and also watch movies, I suppose. That's why they need such high data. So there's a lot of discussion about, I mean, there's, and there's not any discussion, excuse me, there's not any discussion, but there are important decisions being made about how data will move around on campuses. Um, and finally, the, the other wonderful thing about um, the internet and information technology is, um, you know, as a communication medium. So the websites of most campuses, we don't really think of this as an academic freedom issue very often. They're all professionals. That web, web design is now a career, and they're web designers who go and they, they create um, they create the website, they maintain it, they, and they're, none of them are academics. And that does so um, does that not? have a little bit of impact on our, our existence in the public sphere as, as doing our job if the way, the face we present to the public sphere, to our students, most of whom get everything they, they know off of their little pocket distraction rectangle, you know, that, that if that's designed by someone who's not at all an academic and there is no, no mechanism for academic input to the, web, the campus website, um, that's a weird thing. So I'm, I'm trying to say that all of these things that are happening now, they're disruptive, they're uh, changing many of the modalities of, of what we do, and I think that they all have an academic freedom component that we tend to do. We're just kind of letting the, the zeitgeist kind of roll by us and not um, get upset. So I don't know anyone who is even 100th as upset as I am about the fact that my campus website has no faculty input on it. They say, oh, come on, it's a marketing device. That's what, it's a marketing device, but once we get the students on our campus, they go to that damn site a hundred times a day to get information about what's going on our campus. There should be a faculty member who has input on that. It's insane there isn't. And no one even seems to think it's an issue. The LMS, you know, someone has, the LMS, I mean, my God, if you look at the 1915 declaration of um, the AUP um, talking about what is academic freedom, you know, the academic freedom at its core role has to do with our scholarship and our pedagogy. You know, if the way I communicate with my students um, today is entirely through the internet. You know, they get readings off the internet, they log in, they do quizzes, they do fill out little uh, homework assignments and everything, all through the LMS. That is absolutely within the core of where academic freedom, where the rubber meets the road in academic freedom. And people tend to, on our camp, faculty tend to say, oh, I don't like our LMS. It doesn't, all the buttons are on the right side of the windows, I want them on the left side. People, there are some arguments, but there are, they tend to be very, um, you know, practical but not principle. The, the, the LMS decision is, an, is a decision of, of how we instruct our students. It should not be in the hands of the administration. It should be in the hands of the faculty, and the design of the website, the design of the LMS interface should be all in the hands of the faculty. If there are, if you, if there are people who are professionals who are brought in to help build these things, then um, if the faculty need to be their bosses, and if not, that is the absolute spectacular failure of of um, academic freedom. In our fundamental role as educators, that's where the communication is happening. So I, I don't, I, people don't seem to be very upset about this at the moment, but I think we should be upset about this. So one of the reasons I think we should be upset about this, let me say a tiny bit about um, the internet itself. I think that this is a kind of, is a metaphor or, I don't know, a way of thinking about the internet, the rise of this technology um, happening so quickly because thanks to Moore's Law that people are not quite aware of, but um, the, the internet, um, the internet is a neoliberal dystopia. I mean, and we don't, you know, we sort of, we think of it as kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of, oh, it's cool, I can look, you know, I can get the fastest way around LA by going to Waze, and I can get, I can get, I can order my, I could pay for parking here on this campus if I had the right app, right? So we think it's extremely convenient. It's, it's, it's extremely convenient, but it was, so a little bit of the history, the, the internet, um, you know, the internet, of course, is a product of mutual obscured destruction, the, the, the Cold War. The internet was designed, the whole the structure of the internet was designed to resist first strike by the Russians, right? It was a new way of moving data around the country better than phone lines with trunk lines that they could bomb Chicago, and the president in Washington couldn't talk to his silos in Nebraska because all the phone lines went through, Nebra through Chicago. And then they made this distributed network where the packets move around, they try and get closer to their destination. And even if Chicago's gone, the instructions retaliate will get to Nebraska. So, the, neo, the, the internet was born in a moment of you know, horrible global you know, 
preparing for global catastrophe, and it had its adolescence in the sort of post-Reagan, Thatcher, neoliberal moment, right? To think about what we do on the internet. The internet so you, it's important to stop for a moment and think about every service you use on the internet is just a, is a capitalist, neoliberal nightmare. Every single, it just, just stop and think. For, so everyone goes to Google you know, a dozen times a day, right? What is, so Google, so here's my analogy with this. Imagine that in the real world. Google's a search engine company, right? Actually, Google's not a search engine. Google's a marketing company. Right? Their, their main business is not searches. Their business is selling advertisements to you. And how do they get better advertisements? By collecting information about you. So my analogy with Google is, suppose your doctor, when you went, took some blood from you, because to, uh, to do a test of some, we have some condition. And notice, hey, I only used, you know, I took 10 cc's, and I only used one cc for this te blood test. Nine cc's, if I collected that from 100 patients who came into my clinic this afternoon, and I have a couple liters of blood, I could sell it to the Red Cross. The Red Cross is a, is, is a you know, makes money from selling blood. If you ever get a hospital bill, the, the units of blood that you have used come from the Red Cross. If we donate to the Red Cross, they sell it. So suppose my doctor sold, you know, joined all of the little bits of leftover blood. Say, hey, I think this is a good business for me. And suppose they started assigning, you know, offering more services to me, and maybe even not even charging me for certain medical services, just as long as I would take blood tests when I come in. And then they say, and I sign a little thing I'm not paying attention to, they get to sell my blood. This is exactly what Google does. You go there, they provide some cheap service, it costs them fairly little, and they, they suck your blood, on the internet your blood is your information, and they sell it to people. Right? Their business is, is sucking your blood and selling it. It's the same thing with Facebook. Right? So all of these, um, and one last thing, um, the, the word, um, the reason the word app is, education is not an app is in the title, right? I loathe the word app. Um, I, I was programming as a geeky little um, middle schooler, and I wrote programs, <coughs> not apps. There was certain, people started writing apps. Why do they write apps? App is a faster modern word for program. What's the difference between an app and a program? An app is a program that runs in some little controlled environment, like on your iPhone. You know why apps work so through these wonderful apps on the, so many people have very similar apps on their iPhone. I have a scheduling app, I have a calendar, you know, I have, they all have very similar features. They have a little graphical window, they have a little typing interface. They all do the same damn thing. I can just do it through a browser, but I have an app for every second, every separate thing, right? My, on my campus, they're trying to get me to install, I don't have a smartphone because I'm paranoid, but they wanted me to have a smartphone install the Blackboard app on my smartphone. I can get to Blackboard on the web. Why do I need to have an app? The difference between an app and a program is an app is a program that you don't control. Right? It's my machine, I bought it, um, I should control it. And, at, and this is back to the issue of academic freedom. We, we are scholars, we should control the, the devices that um, interface with our students, that um, collect data and sort data and process data for our scholarship, for our service. And if you're using apps, the point of an app is to do some stupid functionality that any damn simple program could do and steal your data and give it to the owner of that app. Right? And if you, if you have an iPhone and you use apps on your iPhone, every purchase you make in the app store, 30% of that profit goes to Apple. And within the app, if you have the Barnes & Noble app and you buy a book at Barnes & Noble on your iPhone, 30% of the price goes to Apple. So yeah, the point of it, the point of it, the word, every time you use the word app, you're saying, I want this fantastic service, and I would like for you please to bleed me while I'm getting the service from you and sell my blood. <laughs> right? That's what an app is, the difference between an app and, and a program. So I, I hate the word app. So we need to be aware of these things happening, on this sort of neoliberal dystopia going on the net, and it's just because people don't, it's a little abstract. And so, you know, we, oh, the fact that they steal all this information from me, um, is, is, is abstract enough that people don't worry about it. If they came into your house and stole, you know, the, the whole thing about fake news, right? Facebook is providing a platform for people to talk, okay, share information. If that platform was on a soapbox in the city square, and they stood up and they said horrible, racist, inflammatory things, someone would shut them up. Right? Or if it was on a campus, there would be all the complicated discussion I should defer to or fire colleague about what you're allowed to say and when, you're, when, you, when you say it, but there would be discussions of it. Instead, it's the neoliberal nightmare, right? Facebook has, one's going to make money out of us talking to each other, our social relationships, and, um, and no one should step on that. No one has the right to tell them not to make money how they see fit, apparently, is the view we have towards the internet. Anyway, so, so I want to say that these are all, when you put them in the context of the university, they're all 
academic freedom issues. You know, who controls the information? Who controls the distribution information? When you get a when you get a Blackboard site, you know, in Black on your campus or Canvas or some other thing, who who owns that? Who owns the intellectual property there? The black the contract with Blackboard is very ambiguous. Um, if you you know, if I wrote a little program to keep my students grades, and they would have to log into the internet to look at their grade, if I wrote a little grade book, I would get in trouble with my administration because of FERPA. But Black Blackboard does it all the time. They don't care. But somehow they're indemnified against FERPA. That's weird. So there are all sorts of things that we are letting this change happen around us and not paying enough attention. Um, um, and it's all academic freedom issues. And I wanted to say one little bit. So I want to finish super quickly. What the the there's a bit of good news here, which is that um, in the midst of this neoliberal nightmare, which is the which is the internet, there was, there's a weird bit of thing which people think is kind of strange. I had a colleague of mine telling was I, I use a piece of software called Tech T E X um, to typeset mathematics, and all mathematicians use it, and most many physicists use it. And it's a completely free piece of software. It's a very fancy piece of software. Beautiful things. What I produce looks like it came out of a textbook. In fact, I've written several textbooks using this, and they look beautiful. Um, and a colleague in the office next to me is saying, oh yeah, the, this professor uses tech. It's, isn't it amazing? It's a really fancy piece of software, and he gets it completely free. So people have probably heard of free and open source software. Free and open source software is not some weird thing that hippies do. It's what we all do. It's called the scholarly project. It's called the scientific method. When I have, when, if I write a scientific paper, I don't say, I've discovered this great new thing. I'm not going to tell you how it works. <laughs> you know, you, you tell people what you discovered, you tell them how the reasoning or the chemical process, if it's a, it's a physical science, you tell them exactly how to, do, how to replicate. That's like giving some a program and giving them the code so they can do it themselves and they can modify it themselves. So open source software is nothing other than the academic scholarly project done in software. So, um, and the good news is that that has been thriving in the whole time that this neoliberal nightmare has been going down. And we've someone was talking about monocultures. You know, most people most people use either Apple or Windows. There's a huge software monoculture which has terrible it's susceptible disease viruses. Um, you know, there are tens of hundreds of thousands of viruses. And this open source software stuff produced by people that we all have a lot in common with. They they produce their scholarship, their code, and they publish it. That's what the, the scholarly project is, and it's better than the commercial <coughs> software, and it doesn't suffer from monocultural, monoculture kind of issues. And um, so the good news is there's great stuff out there that we can do all of the things that people are trying to get to convince us to do with their proprietary apps that steal our information and, um, and sell it and that don't give us the freedom to teach our classes we want. We can do it all on, if we just bother to learn how to use free software instead. So it's called, people call it open source software. The better term is actually free software um, for reasons like but um, so what I'm saying is that we, I, I hope to, to rattle a little bit of people as, you know, think a little bit about the next time you do some service on your campus, you know, maybe they shouldn't have the right to tell me that I can't use the software I want because I, damn it, academic freedom. I get to do what I want to do as a scholar. Um, and this is a vital part of being a scholar. And so I think question that. And, that the, and if, you're, if you're afraid, well, if I question this, there's no alternative. The answer is there are tons of great alternatives. They're all free. They protect your privacy, um, and they're not kind of shaky weirdos that some, you know, what was it Trump said, some 400-pound person, 400 person in the basement produced. It's not, it has really high quality stuff. So most of the internet, most of the web pages you have ever looked at are served to you by a piece of little software called a web server. The, the most common web server on the internet is called Apache. It's free, it's open source, it's free. Um, so much of the backbone of the internet is actually based on free software because it's better, just like science is better than alchemy. It's better to talk about your methods than to keep them secret. And so free software, excuse me, free software is better, and we can use it to solve our problems in, in academia, and we can protect our academic freedom by using, this, by using this other approach. So, you know, it's going to cause you a little bit of pain at first. You know, you know where the menus are in Windows, and you know how to use the Blackboard interface. But say no the next time they say, I want to upgrade your office computer that say, no, don't let them change your office computer with some new thing, because you should decide if you want to change the way you would talk to your students. And the way to get that control is install free software, and, um, and then you control it. And they, you know, I think this is, again, if there are requirement, contingent faculty members may not have the ability to say no, um, but um, if you have any protections or style solidarity, you can work, you can get, can help you protect your 
uh, right to make a choice. As academic freedom says you should have the right, then uh, there is great stuff to, to solve your problems. So it's going to be very painful for most people. I know my wife is a sociologist, she's not a computer geek, and I convinced her to switch to the, alternative, the free alternative to Mac and Windows, which is called Linux. Um, and it was a little painful for at first, and now she has not had to change the interface. You know, we've gone, since I got convinced her to do that, Windows 10 came out, and it, you know, well, now I gotta learn all the new different interfaces and everything. She hasn't, she chooses, she changes things when she wants to. So, yes, you go through the pain once, but then from then on, you, you have control. So, anyway, two pieces of bad news, that the technology is coming into our campuses and it's really scary, and that the backbone of this technology is a neoliberal dystopia, and don't let anyone tell you better anything other than that. And the one piece of good news is that we have something we can fight back, and something that will sound a little weird in the neoliberal worldview, because it's all free. How could they get away with giving it to, to, to me for free? Well, I publish papers, and I give away the proofs of my theorems in my papers for free. Right, so exactly the same way I get a salary, even though I'm giving away this intellectual property of my, of my, my research. That's what makes free software work. Anyway, so that's all I wanted to say. Just, uh, by the way, uh, Jonathan will entertain questions. I, I, lunch has arrived, by the way, and it's, it's out there in the hallway, it so it's... But, questions? I'll just do a comment. Yeah, please. Um, um, like the intellectual MIT and Harvard have put together a website, free browser, free tour, tor.org, and it's private, and um, combine that with propublica.org, which is a investigative journalism website, um, there's also on tour, there's a list of all the uh, journalist publications and their passwords, which are all, pass it's all very protected and very safe. Go to tour as your browser. Yeah, so the, the so tour is a, is a actually it's a tour was originally developed by the U.S. Office of Naval Research, um, and then it went out and came out, and now is open source and everything. And but it's a it protects your privacy when you surf the internet. If you want to you want to do research that that you don't want people to know what you're looking at, um, you know, and, and if you want to report information, whistleblowers should use that thing. So the the interface between the kind of surveillance your administration may do and the kind of surveillance the NSA may do is a kind of weird <coughs> space, but. There are, there are tools that can protect you in a lot of circumstances. Yeah, yes. just uh, one of the, the issues that's come up at, at, at Colorado State is the whole, because they've gone to the, the, the <coughs> Canvas and the, the Unison model and it's affecting you guys too. Um, and that, uh, but, uh, uh, it has to do with the, the online, the, the sort of explosion of online uh, education, which has run through several different uh, sort of portals at, in, at, at CSU, CSU Global, and then you have CSU Online, and CSU uh, One of the things that's, that's really bothered me is the, the whole issue of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and, and CSU, and I suspect CU, are really troglodytes huh? uh, in this issue of intellectual property because when you uh, when, when you agree to offer an online course development an online course, you turn over that intellectual property in perpetuity huh? to to uh, to those uh, folks. Huh? Uh, that, it's a contract. You you sign it. Huh? Uh, there's a lot of pressure to sign it, huh? uh, etc. Et and uh, but. Uh, but plenty of other universities are, are trying to deal with that in a, in a, in a more reasonable way and, and say, well, you'll, you'll sign over a, maybe a contract for a year or two or three. Mm -hmm. And then it's renewable, you get to revisit it, et, et cetera. <clears throat> you, you, have you thought about that, that whole issue of intellectual property? Uh, and do uh, you have anything to say about that, Jonathan? Well, I, I think I, that's a... I mean, actually, one of the MOOCs I, MOOCs I took was a MOOC on copyright law. Um, mm -hmm. Harvard was running a MOOC on the cover, which was a lot of fun to take, and um, uh, it's it's a little bit scary, but it's 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 fun to look into. And I think I think the the, the interesting thing, the the, the point to, to to keep in mind for faculty when you're thinking about these issues of intellectual property is that if you spend the time to read a, a long article or a, even a whole book on intellectual property law, you probably are more an expert than your campus lawyer. Um, I, you know. 
it's 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 the the rules that they'll, they'll try to tell you things are just nonsense, and they you know their their understanding of the of the, those laws I think is is wrong. We had on our campus we had a we have a new acceptable use policy of the of the campus network and all of the, the resources on the campus was 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 shoved down our throats by the system and board of governors and. The president of the, of the spoke to the Senate once and, and was asked to interpret this new thing. And she gave us totally nonsensical interpretation. I mean, absolutely no sense. And her interpretation is in direct conflict with the rest of the faculty handbook. So I think intellectual property is a thing, you know, I don't know. Per personally, I'm kind of a, an anarchist. I really don't want to make money. If I wanted to make money, I mean, I used to work in industry. If I wanted to make money, I would still be in industry. I, I, don't, I want to publish my things. So I don't, you know, I give, I've written several textbooks and put them on my website. And so. I think there are issues. The, the interesting thing about intellectual property law is it comes, has to do with course materials, and this is one that the, the new faculty majority should pay attention to, is that often the rules are specifically written that any course materials produced by contingent faculty are automatically, they have no intellectual property rights. So automatically, tenured faculty, tenure line faculty ten, tend to have some standard, it's complicated, because the rule would be that the basic copyright law, basic copyright law would say we do not own any of the intellectual property we produce as a university, because we're employees, and most employees don't get intellectual property rights in what they produce in, in the course of their employment. The standard thing in universities, for as the tradition, and it's written into most faculty handbooks, is that no, we get the intellectual property right of our textbooks, our research work, um, patents, things like that. And then there are specific writers that go the other way. Maybe for a patent, they get the right to 10%, you know, 70% of the income. And now you're saying, these online materials, there are detail, details that you should, we should be paying attention to. And whatever the hell the rule is, um, it should be the same for the contingent faculty as it is for the tenure line faculty. And it's almost never the same. Yeah, well, I, and I think that, that one of the trends, and I'm sure this is happening everywhere else, uh, is that contingents are, are the, the primary group that, uh, of faculty that are being asked to pick up the load with online uh, 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 education. So, um, um, Jonathan, um, you know what? Your, the, the point that you made really resonates really strongly with what's going on at our university at Metro State. We have had this proliferation, and um, <coughs> our faculty senate, you know. Um, um, a few years ago, did um, you know finally get to get these things written in where you have to? It is not automatically owned by the school, and so on and so forth. But one of the bizarrest things that's happened as we sort of go through the second generation of this is all it takes is one faculty member, tenure track or tenured or adjunct, to sign away that right. All it takes is one faculty member to make a computer 1010 course and get paid an extra two thousand, three thousand. In the case I'm thinking of, it's $5,000. Turn that over to the institution, and that is now something that gets to be taught 70 times a uh, semester. Um, so with all the protections that we work through and all of the money that we actually spent individually as lawyers and the ground that we held for two years to put that information in there, all it takes is one person to say, I am more than happy to sell my intellectual property. Um, I have the right to do that because it's mine. I have now turned this over to the institution for an absolutely nominal fee. And then what you have are, you know, English professors looking at, well, where's, you know, I can get $5,000 for doing that. And I was going to retire anyways and so on and so forth. And these become kind of the bread and butter general ed courses. And now they are, you know, they are, they are taught by a machine. They are evaluated by a machine. Grades are assigned by a machine, and they literally are this incredibly attractive model. And everything that we put into place, where you know you maintain the property right, the faculty member maintains the property right, was circumvented because one individual or two individuals can choose to sell their their the property right that we fought so hard for them to get. How would you address something like that? Well, again, I think that faculty need to step up. We need to, you know, we need to control what we produce and pr don't produce it in some canned environment that they, that they will easily insert into their online presence. Um, that's a, you know, I think it's it's a bait and switch, right? You know, that you're right. The people who are very vulnerable or pers easily persuaded if they're about to retire or if they don't have protections of, of tenure or 
Um, or in this case, they actually got extra money to do it. Yes. Specifically a contract that said you were developing for the school. So there was no question as to what was going on. I mean, but I agree, but we're being played, right? But, you know, so, yes. I mean, you know, we're being, you know the law, they offer wonderful suites to, to tempt us. You know, for example, in May, I spend more time than I spend talking to my family. I spend grading homework sets. And wouldn't it be wonderful if that were automatic, right? And they're now, the publishers sell these automatic grading studies. And they're now even appearing in the humanities, right? It'll grade, it'll, and there are automatic assessments of essays, right? I just read an interesting computer science article about, about checking automatic plagiarism detectors can find these things, but then there are uh, programs that can take an automatically generated essay and perturb it just enough that the plagiarism detector doesn't detect it. Um, so, but they offer us this great, this, toy, this wonderful, bit of sweet, you know, you're not going to have to spend those hours grading, just, just, you know, lose control over your course, you know, and just deliver something, I mean, it's just nonsensical, I mean, the, there is no way that automatic grading is the same as me, I'd say, you know, if the automatic grading were the same as me, then the Turing test would be satisfied, that machine would be as smart as a human, right, it's not, um, so, so, I, I, I don't have a good answer, I think they offer us, they offer, they tempt us with wonderful things, and money, and, and saving our time, and we have to say no. You know, that, and the same thing, we have to do a little bit of work. I mean, it's easier for me. I apologize, I have this elite status that I've you know, studied computers my whole life, but everyone in this room should spend a little time to learn something that is not under the control of your employer. I mean, if you want to organize, for example, your email is run through the campus service. You really think that they're not looking at what you say? I guarantee they are. If you, and if you, even if you run some other app, um, on your Windows installation, on your desktop, in your office. They control the Windows installation on your office. You tell me they're not watching the keystrokes you type? They are, I, I will tell you, they are. So if you want to organize on a campus, don't use the campus communication service. And the, the only way to control, control it yourself, and there, the good news is there's lots of very communion free software to do it and do it much better, protected by, you know, really protect your, the same privacy that protects whistleblowers that turn in the Panama Papers, you know, can protect you organizing your adjunct uh, um, union, right? So, but take advantage of it. Spend the time to learn it. And, 